Proverbs 9.10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Proverbs 4.7 goes on to say, The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, and whatever else you get, get insight. Wisdom in Scripture and in other ancient Near East literature, notably in ancient Egypt, is often personified as in Proverbs 1.20, Wisdom cries out in the street, in the squares she raises her voice. And Proverbs 8.1, Does not wisdom call and understanding raise her voice? This imagery describes our freedom to acknowledge, receive, understand and apply wisdom or not, Hayes says that a wisdom instruction usually contains proverbial sayings but is framed as a speech from a figure of higher stature to a student. He describes a proverbial saying as a concise sentence, often metaphorical or alliterative in form, which is held to express some truth ascertained by experience or observation and familiar to all. Jacobson and Chan note that although wisdom offers protection and gives life, wisdom cannot always protect against the vagaries of history. They conclude that wisdom comes in knowing the limits of human reasoning. Proverbs emphasizes timeless nuggets of wisdom that can easily be taught, memorized, and applied to lives in any culture, era, or location using poetry, axioms, discourses, and humor to communicate truth about life. This book answers the questions, what is the good life, and how should we then live? Job forces us to wrestle with the problem of human suffering like no other book in Scripture. Jacobson and Chan note that Job both attracts and repels readers, describing the book as a masterpiece of theological composition and a spiritual treasure. Job simultaneously inspires and infuriates, primarily because of our human propensity to ask, why? God makes no promise to explain the whys of our lives, notably why people suffer, especially the ones we most clearly see do not deserve it. In the book of Job, God assures us that in the middle of our suffering, He is present with us, because He not only made all that there is, but He made us and knows us and comforts us and blesses us. And because of God's unconditional love for us, we are invited to be completely honest with God. As Jacobson and Chan comment, God can take it. As God is present with us in suffering, we too can be present with others to comfort and bless them. Each of these books is precious to me, and I read frequently from each one. God met me deeply in Job 1, 21, when my mother died by suicide. I turn weekly to Proverbs as I face personal and pastoral situations, but Ecclesiastes is the wisdom book that has most resonated with me over the course of my life. In my teens, I discussed passages from this with friends who claimed atheism. It was a great starting point for deeper conversations because they could easily see the vanity slash futility of life. It is helpful in our me-centered world to remember that there is nothing new under the sun, in the sense that no matter what you or I or anyone else is going through, God can handle it and will help us. In a world obsessed with the pursuit of pleasure, Ecclesiastes reminds us that no amount of pleasure will satisfy us. In a world that tends to tilt too much to the past, whether in reminiscence or regret, or to the future, whether in formulating goals or fantasizing, Ecclesiastes encourages us to live in the present. There is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live, Ecclesiastes 3.12. I cannot omit mentioning the oft-quoted song beginning, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, Ecclesiastes 3.1-8. 
This has encouraged me through the challenges of life, knowing that God is present with us in whatever we're experiencing, whether we would consider it good or bad, desirable or abhorrent. And the conclusion of the book contains one of the best summaries of how we are to live. Ecclesiastes 12.13 Fear God and keep His commandments, for that is the whole duty of everyone.